Hey guys, welcome back to Nifty Invest. In this video, we delve into the expert perspective of Lynette Tsang, a seasoned observer of currencies and currency life cycles since 1987. With a clear conviction that the flat money experiment is coming to an end, she shares her belief that we are now witnessing a transition towards a full surveillance monetary system. Lynette stresses the critical importance of holding silver and gold in one's possession as a safeguard against the potential pitfalls of this transition. As we explore her views, we uncover the key reasons behind her assertion and the role precious metals play in protecting one's wealth. Lynette Zhang begins by asserting her unwavering conviction that the fiat money experiment is reaching its culmination. Having witnessed over 4,800 fiat currencies become obsolete throughout history, she sees our current system heading in the same direction. Drawing on her expertise, she cites a favored graph, the purchasing power graph from the Federal Reserve, as evidence of the ongoing erosion of fiat currency value. She explains that the system's shift to a pure debt-based model after 1971 has hastened inflation, bringing us closer to the endgame. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content we do here on this channel. Let's get right into the video. I've been studying currencies and currency life cycles since 1987. And there is absolutely zero doubt in my mind, zero doubt, but that this is the end of this fiat money experiment. And what they're trying to do is transition us into the next iteration of the fiat money experience uh, or experiment, which is really a full surveillance monetary system. And that's what makes having silver and gold in your possession so critical. So, I mean, there's yeah. no doubt. Where do you hear my hesitation is, yes, it is inevitable that they're going to bring it out, but it is not inevitable that it will be adopted. That's going to be up to the community and to the population because, you know, we vote with our purses. We vote with our wallets. So if you're buying gold and silver, that's your vote. If you're keeping it in this garbage, I mean, you know, there are over 4,800 currencies, fiat money currencies that do not exist anymore. And ours is going exactly, you know, this crap is going the same way. This is just a derivative of this and of this, mm -hmm. right? But this is real money, this is fake. But my favorite graph, and everybody that watches knows I like my charts and my graphs, but if you said to me you could only work with one, it would be the purchasing power graph from the Federal Reserve because you can see the whole story right there. And you can explain the whole story just from that one, that one graph. And yeah, it's going to zero because yeah. that's what happens. Because what? This is, especially after 1971, we went to a pure debt-based system. Well, you got to pay interest on that debt. And so that just accelerates the inflation. And now we're at the end. And so when you hear everybody being so confused about the market action, about the currency, what's happening in the currency markets and this and that and the other thing, it's because we're at the end. So it is confusing because things aren't working the way the system was set up to function. They're not functioning the same way. But, but nobody ever says, well, this must be the end of the system. Well, they can't. They're cheerleaders for the system, so they can't actually say that. I mean, they created the spot market to manage, and these are their words, they're not my words, to manage people's perception of particularly gold because gold is the primary currency metal, and a rising gold price is an indication of a failing currency. Lynette highlights the confusion surrounding the current state of the currency markets emphasizing that we are at the end of the system's functionality. Many financial pundits are reluctant to acknowledge this reality as they serve as cheerleaders for the system. However, Lynette reveals how central banks have manipulated the perception of gold by creating spot markets to maintain control over the narrative. Rising gold prices signal a weakening currency, a clear indication that the current monetary system is on its last legs. As rapid inflation takes hold, the general public is becoming more conscious of the imminent demise of the currency system. Economic disparities are growing, leading to disillusionment with the idea of achieving the American dream. 
Younger generations are increasingly burdened by student loan debts, which cast doubts on the feasibility of owning homes, raising families, and achieving financial stability. Lennett predicts that this discontent will pave the way for the introduction of central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, as a means of increasing control over the populace. Informed by her background as an ex-banker and stockbroker, Lynette cautions against investing in traditional financial instruments, as she understands the language and intentions behind them. Instead, she advises her audience to consider holding wealth in gold and silver as a means of protecting their financial independence. She reminds viewers that precious metals are deeply ingrained in our cultural history, evoking references to the golden goose and the golden rule. Even in the realm of cryptocurrencies, gold and silver colors remain prevalent. And if you know, or once you know, I should say, that that currency is actually dying and going away, then you start to make different choices and you start to take your wealth outside of the system. I mean, I'm an ex-banker. I'm an ex-stockbroker. Do you know how many stocks or bonds or mutual funds or ETFs or annuities or any or CDs? Do you know how much of that I have? Zero. Zero. Because I understand the language and I understand what they're doing. And I was there in the 80s as everything was really kind of kicking off and all this talk about globalization. So they needed to really trap you in it. But this is the interesting thing. Gold and silver is part of our DNA. It's part of our vernacular. The golden goose, the golden rule, when they create the cryptocurrencies, what, col what color are they? They're either gold <laughs> or they're silver, right? Yeah. So. You know, it's part of our DNA. And yes, I, I agree with you. I think especially with this rapid inflation, that's that makes the demise of the currency more obvious to the general public. And they're starting to go, wait a minute. You know, here, this is the American dream. You're supposed to, if you work hard, you can have your own home, you can raise a family, you can get educated, you can send your kids, all of this stuff, you can, you can have the American dream. But more and more of the younger people past my generation are waking up to the fact that that American dream is always going to be out of their reach. They go to college, but what kind of income do they make after that? But they're saddled with all of this debt. Now that's going away. Of course, they have to, the, you know, they got a little bit of a reprieve for a few years. That's now going away. But people are getting very discouraged and they don't believe the American dream is possible anymore. And so that's why I say, Absolutely. It's inevitable that they're going to bring out the new CBDCs, the surveillance economy, because they want even more control than they have with this stuff. Mm -hmm. But we don't have to accept it, right? If we hold most of our wealth inside of this, this is our vote. And guess what? If there's just a very vocal 3% that get this, <clears throat> well, that's all they needed for the Revolutionary War. A very yeah. vocal 3%. Here's the problem, and you can see it. When they first came out with the quantitative easing, so money for free, all of this money printing, every iteration afterwards took a lot more money and they were getting a lot less result. And they have been on this quantitative easing and even now, you know, they call it quantitative tightening, but globally money is still extremely loose. Whenever you have interest rates that are below the real rate of inflation, that's easy money. I don't care if you had interest rates at 20%, right? Lynette analyzes the ongoing quantitative easing efforts and the challenges central banks face in maintaining control over their yield curves. The recent events with the Bank of Japan, where they had to adjust their monetary policy quickly, serve as a warning sign that we are approaching the end of this monetary experiment. Lynette cautions that, although it's challenging to predict the exact timing, the canary in the coal mine is singing, indicating that the end may be closer than we realize. Lynette emphasizes that the future of the monetary system is not entirely predetermined. While the introduction of CBDCs and a surveillance economy may seem inevitable, the ultimate decision lies with the community and the population. By consciously choosing to hold wealth in precious metals, individuals can express their vote against a surveillance monetary system 
and maintain control over their financial destinies. If the rate of inflation is at 30%, that's still easy money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for them to talk about tightening is kind of garbage, but it is becoming more and more challenging for people to roll or corporations or governments or whatever to roll over that debt. So mm -hmm. in some ways there's easing and some ways there's tightening. Just like look at the Bank of Japan, right? They lost control of their yield curve control, but I've done pieces on that historically as they've been going along. So it's pretty obvious that they were losing control. But rather than making it obvious to the public, what did they do? They broadened their band. They did that on Friday mm -hmm. and on Monday, they announced a major bond buying program. I mean, those are just <laughs> the opposite. So what does that tell us? Because Bank of Japan is really the leader in the world of all of these experiments, these monetary experiments. And that started back in the early 90s. And, you know, they're the ones that created the zombie firms. So, and, and this yield curve control. Okay, so you print a whole bunch of money and you go in and you buy a whole bunch of bonds to control the price. And all that really does is convolute interest rates out there, the, pr the value of the money, the price of the money. So, uh, you know, when I see that on Friday they did loosening and on Monday they did tightening because what happened, boy, <laughs> shocker, interest <laughs> rates yeah. exploded on their 10 year JGB of which they own most of that anyway. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it tells me that we are closer and closer and closer to the end of this experiment. And I think what we just saw with the Bank of Japan is the canary in the coal mine. And I'm paying a lot of attention because it ain't over yet. Just like the bank eruption that we had in March. But do you think all those issues, those underwater investments went away? Do you think they're not a Bank of America and God forbid JP Morgan and every other bank on the planet? Of course they are. They're just being hidden. But how long can they do that? that that's really what the question is, not what's going to happen. It's exactly when. So now mm -hmm. look at this. No, did you know there's not going to be a recession? Yeah, I know. And, I, and I'm really relieved because Janet Yellen came out a while ago and said there would not be another financial crisis in her lifetime. <laughs> so now that we know there's not going to be another recession, I guess that means she gets to live longer. The problem is, is that we haven't really felt the full effect. I mean, the economy has not yet felt the full effect of that rapid rise in interest rates because of the lag effect. So this is the good thing about CBDCs. And especially when you read what they say, because they will have their finger on that button 24 seven and they will yeah. get instant <clears throat> response if their policy choices are working. That I don't know about you, but that scares the Hades out of me.